Hello and welcome to this biopsychology topic video, this one looking at the ways of studying the brain, the outline and the evaluation. Now this video is one of three and in part two we'll look at how to answer different types of questions, uh, exam related questions and then in part three we'll look at how to structure and write an essay on this particular topic. Now let's start by looking at how to outline the different ways of studying the brain. So the first method we'll look at is functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. fMRI is a brain scanning technique that measures blood flow in the brain when a person performs a particular task. fMRI works on the assumption that the neurons in the brain that are the most active use the most energy and energy requires both glucose and oxygen. Now oxygen is carried in the bloodstream attached to haemoglobin which is found in the red blood cells and is released for use by these active neurons at which point the haemoglobin becomes deoxygenated. Now deoxygenated haemoglobin has a different magnetic quality from oxygenated haemoglobin and an fMRI scanner can detect these different magnetic qualities to create a dynamic 3D map of the brain. Now there are two useful and important concepts that I'll introduce you to here that we'll come back to when evaluating the different ways of studying the brain and these include temporal resolution and spatial resolution. Now in terms of temporal resolution fMRI images show activity approximately one to four seconds after they actually occur. So the coloured activity you see in the picture on the centre of the screen actually might have appeared up to four seconds after the brain activity actually occurred. And we'll explore the importance of that concept later. However, fMRI images are thought to be accurate within one to two millimetres, making them a very accurate, spatially accurate technique for studying the brain. Now the second way of studying the brain that we'll look at is EEG, which stands for electroencephalogram. Okay. EEG scanners measure electrical activity for electrodes that are attached to the scalp. And EEG works on the premise that information is processed in the brain as an electrical, ac electrical activity in the form of action potential or nerve impulses which are transmitted along neurons. Okay. Now small electrical changes or charges detected by the electrodes are graphed over a period of time and these indicate the level of activity in the brain. There are four types of EEG patterns, which include alpha waves, beta waves, theta waves, and delta waves. And you can see each of those four patterns on the screen now. Now, each of those patterns has two basic properties that psychologists can use to examine. And these include the amplitude, which is the intensity or size of the activity. So if you look at the delta wave on screen, you'll see that has the largest amplitude. And then frequency, which is the speed or the quantity of the activity, and again, if you look at the diagram on screen and look at the beta or the alpha waves, you'll see that these have the higher frequencies. On top of that, EEG patterns also produce two distinctive states, including synchronized and desynchronized patterns. Now, a synchronized pattern is a recognizable waveform, for example, an alpha, beta, delta or theta wave where these can be detected. Whereas a desynchronized pattern is where there is no recognizable waveform. So we can't detect any of those four, usually because there's a mixture of all four. Now, fast desynchronized patterns are usually found when a person's awake. Although that being said, beta waves are also associated with a normal waking state when attention is directed towards a particular task. Whereas synchronized patterns are typically found during sleep. And we're going to look at those in a later webinar when we look at the infraradian rhythms and the ultra diem rhythms. Now, in terms of the different waves, alpha waves are associated with light sleep and theta and delta waves are associated with progressively deeper stages of sleep. EEG has also been responsible for developing our understanding of dream sleep, REM sleep, which is associated with a fast desynchronized activity indicative of dreaming. Last but not least, EEG has also been used to detect illnesses like epilepsy and sleep disorders and to diagnose other disorders that affect brain activity, uh, things like Alzheimer's disease. So a very, very useful brain scanning technique. A third and related technique for studying the brain is ERP, which stands for Event Related Potentials. The reason it's related is because ERP uses similar equipment to EEG and that is electrodes attached to the scalp. However, the key difference is that a stimulus is presented to a participant, for example, a picture or a sound, and the researcher looks for activity related to that particular stimulus. However, as ERPs are difficult to separate from all of the other background EEG data, the stimulus is presented many times, usually hundreds of times or even thousands, and an average response is graphed over a period of time. This procedure is known as averaging, and what this does is it reduces any extraneous neural activity which makes the specific response to the stimulus stand out 
as you're about to see on screen now. Now the time or the interval between the presentation of the stimulus and the response is referred to as latency when it comes to ERPs. And ERPs typically have a very short latency that can be divided into two broad categories. Waves that occur within the first 100 milliseconds following the presentation, for example of the sound or the picture, are referred to as sensory ERPs as they reflect a sensory response to a stimulus, whereas ERPs that occur after 100 milliseconds are referred to as cognitive ERPs as they demonstrate some form of information processing that's taken place. Again, I'd like to refer you to these two broad concepts, temporal resolution and spatial resolution, that I'm going to come back to in the evaluation. Now, for EEG and ERP, these are the same because actually they use the same type of equipment. And EEG and ERP actually show activity every millisecond, therefore recording activity in nearly real time, where therefore meaning they've got really good uh, temporal resolution. Whereas in terms of spatial resolution, EEGs and ERPs can only detect activity in superficial general areas of the brain. So they're not very specific when it comes to locating a particular brain activity in a particular part of the brain. The final method of investigating the brain is post-mortem examination, where the researchers will study the physical brain of a person who displayed a particular behaviour or characteristic while they were alive that suggested possible brain damage. An example of this technique is the work of uh, Paul Broca or Carl Wernicke, who examined the brain of men who displayed speech and language problems when they were still alive. Now, Paul Broca uh, discovered that his patient, who was called Patient Tan, had a lesion in the area of the brain, which he inferred is important for speech production. Now, this lesion was in the posterior left frontal lobe, which later became known as the Broca's area that you can see on screen now. In addition to this, the method is, uh, of investigation has also contributed to our understanding of many other disorders. For example, Iverson uh, examined the brains of deceased schizophrenic patients and found that they had a higher concentration of dopamine, especially in the limbic system, which is highlighted on the screen now in red, compared with the brains of other schizophrenics, uh, with people without schizophrenia, sorry, highlighting the importance of such investigations for our understanding of psychopathology. On top of that, post-mortem studies allow for a really detailed examination of the anatomical and neurochemical aspects of the brain that would not be possible with other techniques. So what they enable researchers to do is examine the deeper regions of the brain, for example, the limbic system, the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, and so forth, which is not possible with other methods of investigation. So you can see why this particular uh, way of studying the brain is particularly useful. So there we have it, we've just looked at the outline. Let's now look at how we might evaluate these different ways of studying the brain. And I think there are four great ways that we can use to uh, evaluate the different ways of studying the brain. And these include the key terms of spatial resolution, temporal resolution, which I've mentioned earlier, the idea of whether a treatment is invasive or non-invasive, and then the idea of causation. So let's take each of those in turn. Now, spatial resolution refers to the smallest feature or measurement that a scanner can detect. Now think about televisions or smart TVs these days, most people want the best resolution and likewise when it comes to brain scanners we want the best resolution as well. So it's an important feature of brain scanning techniques. Now I mentioned earlier that fMRI scanners have a spatial resolution of just one to two millimeters, so are deemed as very very accurate. Whereas the EEG and ERP method only look at superficial general regions of the brain and therefore have a very low spatial resolution. So you can see the difference between those two techniques. If we look at temporal resolution, this refers to the accuracy of the scanner in relation to time or how quickly the scanner can detect the uh, brain activity. And as I mentioned earlier, fMRI scanners have a temporal resolution of between one and four seconds, which is actually quite delayed, especially if we compare it to EEG and ERP, which measures brain activity nearly every millisecond, especially between one and 10 milliseconds, and therefore shows us actually that EEG and ERP have a much better temporal resolution in comparison to fMRI. If we take the idea of invasive slash non-invasive, fMRI, EEG and ERP are all particularly non-invasive treatments. And unlike other scanning techniques, for example, PET scans, positron emission tomography. Now, I know that's one you don't need to study. It's useful here just as a comparison to the three that you do. fMRI, EEG and ERP do not use any radiation. They do not involve inserting instruments directly into the brain. And therefore, they're virtually risk-free when it comes to a scanning technique in comparison to something like positron emission tomography. And this is obviously good because it enables more people to take part in the scans and therefore further understanding of the human brain. 
Last but not least, if we look at the idea of causation, fMRI scanners do not provide a direct measure of any neural activity. They simply measure changes in blood flow and, th and therefore it's impossible to infer any causation, especially at a neural level. If we think about post-mortem examination, it's important here to think about the idea that the deficit that a person displayed during their lifetime, for example an inability to speak, may not be linked to the deficits found in the brain, for example a damaged Broca's area. Now the deficits reported could have been the result of another illness and therefore psychologists are unable to conclude that the deficit is caused by the damage found in the brain. Okay. So again, this lack of causation is an issue here. In terms of EEG, uh, another issue with EEG is that the electrical activity is often detected in several regions of the brain simultaneously and therefore it's difficult to pinpoint the exact area or region of activity making it difficult for researchers to draw accurate conclusions. But interestingly, ERP enables the determination of how processing is affected by a specific experimental manipulation, so a stimulus presentation. And that makes ERP a more experimentally robust method because it can eliminate the extraneous neural activity, something that the other techniques can fail to do. So here's a summary table outlining each of the four methods and listing those evaluation strengths and limitations in terms of invasive and non-invasive, temporal resolution, spatial resolution, and then the final column looking at the idea of causation. Okay? A really useful table, and this can be used when answering many different types of questions, uh, as you're going to see in part two of this video. So there you have it. In this video, we've outlined and evaluated the different ways of studying the brain. Hope you found this useful, and thank you for watching. Goodbye now.